I've always had a thing for medicine and I really love Frankenstein and now there's this new web series called Frankenstein MD and I want to talk about it so we're going to talk about it. Hi my name is Emily and this is Blink Pop Chefs. IBM just released a new chip that promises to revolutionize the way computers work. Let's talk how it works, what it means, and what Dr. Frankenstein has to do with it. Meet Northwest, I mean, True North. IBM's newest creation, the brain-inspired chip of the future. So how does it work? Let's do a little computer science review to get everybody on the same page. Today's computers use something called von Neumann architecture, invented by John von Neumann. Son of a banker made noble back when the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a thing. He invented lots of stuff and was the type to have published major mathematical papers by the age of 19. You know, you know, you know, precocious. He's fun, look him up. His architecture let computers do stuff by sending data back and forth between storage and processing. This, by the way, works fantastically well for doing calculations. Store, process. This is why software is written as a set of linear instructions to be followed precisely in one order. Get it mixed up and suddenly all that code is meaningless. It works great. It works great, but this constant back and forth between memory and processing causes traffic jams in the data, which limits the speed of the entire process. Store process. So far, our solution to this clock has been a more roads, higher speed limits kind of thing. I mean, more transistors and higher clock speeds can never go wrong, right? And you've heard of Moore's Law. We became experts at packing more and more transistors into a smaller and smaller space. Unfortunately, just because there are more of them doesn't mean they use less energy. So packing more and more of them in eventually means you start to burn out the chips. And that's where we've come to as Moore's Law has begun to plateau. Pretty clear? Okay, now the hard part. Not hard because I feel like this chip is particularly hard to understand, but because IBM went to the trouble of naming all of their components after anatomical parts, which sometimes are, but often are not related to the function of the thing on the chip. So helpful. Neuron, axon, synapse. If somebody breaks out the word dendrite, I am gonna lose my mind. This new chip has 5.4 billion transistors sir, 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 squashed into 256 processors, each of which the marketing department has helpfully decided to call neurons for obvious reasons. But there's no linear interaction between processors. They're laid out in an array of rows and columns, all of which process in parallel and are connected to the totally misnamed synapses, which is where the memory is stored. I will admit that I can make the argument that you could call a synapse a place where a memory is stored because you are storing information between the interaction of two neurons using neurotransmitters. And sure, you could argue that that is a very, very basic form of short-term memory, but no, they're not, it's not where memory is stored. Processors and synapses are connected by an axon, which acts as a gate, either allowing or hindering power and information to run through the synapse into the processor. Once the neuron processor figures out its tiny bit of the problem and thus meets its threshold potential, it spikes, spitting out its information into the synapse and re resetting itself. Now do that with all 256 processors simultaneously, all inter-affecting each other's outcomes and actions, a process by the way IBM calls event-driven, you kind of get a sense of this cool new thing. If you're terribly confused, don't worry. Lots of tech journalists are too. So here's your metaphor. Think of all those so-called neurons as cores in your current central processing unit. Not up here, I mean in your laptop. Cores are processing units that run in parallel. Process, store, process. store. There's been some hemming and hawing about how one would even program for these systems, but it's not as, but it's not as though there's no historical precedent. Erlang. Store time. Erlang was designed from the bottom up to program concurrent, distributed, fault tolerant, scalable, soft real time systems. Soft real time systems are things like telephone networks, where rapid response times are important, but it's not a disaster if the odd timing deadline is missed. It's a mutable state, stupid. And sure, there will need to be improvements. For example, Erlang does not allow for inter-process communication and tinkering. But this kind of inter-process scoodly-pooping ha- scoodly-pooping? 
scootily pooping. God damn, that's a hard word to say. But this kind of, but this kind of inner process scootily pooping happens all the time in the brain and now on this new chip. So we will have to up our programming language game for this new hardware. And because it's operating in parallel and uses integrated memory, it uses way less power than a traditional processor. I feel like half of you are like totally rabid and are like, why are you not going into every single technical detail right at this moment? And then the other half of you are like, oh God, if she doesn't stop talking about computer hardware, I'm gonna go to sleep. Stick with me, stick with me, I promise. We'll get to the philosophical implications and the fun part in just a second. All of this awesome means that the chip will be able to use data the way that we do. Take behaviors like sound and facial recognition, for example. They require us to not only receive large amounts of data through our inputs, a process called sensing, but also store and process and recognize patterns in that mountain of data. That half of the equation is something we call perceiving and is the nascent horizon of computing promised by this new chip. It has the potential to turn not only cameras and microphones into eyes and ears, but allow computers Computers to use sensors to monitor wind speed and temperature and pressure and to perceive oncoming storms. Sure, the most impressive thing it can do is recognize a triangle from part of a triangle, but you know, that's after learning what triangles look like instead of being like programmed and told what a triangle is. Your newborn baby cannot do that. So, you know, give it a break baby. But what your human baby does have is a fully functional human brain. A hundred billion neurons connected by a hundred trillion synapses running. And this is my favorite part on just 20 watts of power, 20 watts. By comparison, IBM invented a power-hungry quarter of a mouse brain, but that quarter of a mouse brain is growing. IBM even says that its chips communicate via an interchip system with, quote, scalability like the cortex, enabling creation of scalable neuromorphic systems. Seamless scalability is just fancy press release talk for bigger is not harder, which is good news because we, like Dr. Frankenstein, like to go big. We will not stop at human size. We won't stop at the arbitrary biological limit achieved by evolution. We can do better than that. The doctor didn't simply dig up one dead body, complete in every way, but for a beating heart and juice it back to life. No, he pieced together something larger, something monstrous, something part farm animal, part human. We want to make life, but not just human life and not just quarter of a mouse brain life, but something larger and bigger and better than us. Dr. Frankenstein wanted to pioneer a new way, explore unknown parts and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. Because don't we all just wanna flip a giant switch and yell, it's alive! I know, I know that never happened in the book, but the fact that flipping a giant switch and shouting it's alive has become basically culturally synonymous with Frankenstein, doesn't that like tell you something? I mean, that is our scientific imagination. In stories, things happen suddenly. You get the end results of your experiments all at once. You get to live the moment it comes alive on a jolt of electricity, but that only happens in stories. And maybe it's better that way. To quote Mary Shelley, there is nothing so painful to the human mind as the great and sudden change. We crave our creations to come alive and likely they will. IBM's chip is yet another step on that road, but we have to learn how to maintain both vigilance and deserved celebration in the face of the constant drip, 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 drip of steady progress so that one day we don't awaken next to this larger than life thing and run from our creation in horror. I mean, we all know that's where everything went wrong. From quarter of a mouse brain to superhuman, you can find me at Emily Eifler. And as always, thank you for watching and get curious. Is the show really over? Are you recording? Is audio recording? Everything is recording. Okay. Everything is recording except I lost my script. Where did I? I just has it. 
Script. Just one second. 